Welcome to a lecture presented by the members of the Syracuse, New York class. My name is Sharon Walsh and I'll be your moderator for this class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated and shown proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school is a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. Since that time, we've uh, had schools throughout the United States, Canada, and other certain foreign countries. The Syracuse, New York class was established in 1969. The dean of the of our class is Dr. Patrick Trevison. Our president is Dr. Robert Welch. And our vice president is Dr. John Cometti. In this school, we, to, we teach by the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been mistranslated to read Lord. The true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been mistranslated to read God. <clears throat> the true name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been mistranslated to read Jesus. Now, Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, states in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and that there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that is the title that the Creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it's an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah making such names as Jesus and Jehovah improper renderings of the true name of the Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in that state he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have this cloud painted all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the cloud abides within everything on the chart abides within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in that pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself, known as Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being. That is the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. That form could only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelation. <clears throat> that form later on this self-same spirit manifested himself and walked the earth plane, known as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world erroneously calls Jesus Christ. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name so simple yet intelligent question we must ask ourselves is what was the name of the Messiah at the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of the name and title can be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. 
Also in the school, we teach by a divine pattern. It's called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This tabernacle pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. We also go about to show proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of the threefold tabernacle pattern, and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Our ten primary constitutional aims and objectives are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without the distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religion, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered in the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby men can be saved, <clears throat> saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. At this time, I'd like to have the class dedicated in prayer by Dr. Frank DeMassey, and that'll be followed by a scripture, which is Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, and that and all scriptures will be read by Dr. Scott Miller, and Dr. Deb Cometti will be our other reader for this class. Dr. DeMassey. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Let each and every one of us take a moment. Let us bow our hearts and minds. Let's get all the thoughts of the flesh and of the day out of our heads and get in that special place within our heart that we can communicate with our Heavenly Father. Dear Father, thank you for allowing us one more opportunity to stand before and to testify this glorious gospel. We ask that you Allow your spirit to flourish through your chosen vessels tonight so that you may get the glory that you so righteously deserve and that the body may be edified. We ask that each and every one of us realize and appreciate the gift of grace that's been bestowed upon us, that the creator of all things saw fit in his purpose to pull us out of chaos, misery, and anxiety and brought us to a place of peace right, right within our hearts. Let us always be appreciative of what we know. Let us always love the truth, and let always let us always love one another. We ask this in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. May we all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening and afternoon, class. Tonight's scripture will be read out of the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trana of the Scripture Research Association. 
Ezekiel, the eighth chapter. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of Yahweh Elohim fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand, and took me by the lock, by a lock of mine head. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of Elohim to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the Elohim of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the north door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and the idols of all the house of Israel, portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, Yahweh seeth us not, Yahweh hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahweh's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat woman, weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of Yahweh's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of Yahweh, between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of Yahweh and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is, is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. That's Ezekiel, the eighth chapter. Thank you very much, Dr. DeMassey and Dr. Miller. And I'd like to uh, thank everyone that has joined us in our Zoom room and also those that are viewing us um, uh, on our live YouTube uh, channel. Um, uh, this will, We will have a three-speaker format for this class, and there will be a verbal five-minute warning for each speaker. <clears throat> Please acknowledge that you've heard the five-minute warning. And... Now, it is a pleasure and an honor to call on our first speaker, which will be Dr. Tony Pagano from our Gates, New York class. Dr. Pagano, are you able to speak? Yes, good evening. Good evening. I'm just listening to that beautiful scripture, thinking I have no clue how to work with that. <laughs> Um, so let's see. 
Um, I guess the first thought I have um, is that, um, you know, Yahweh has always spoken to his creatures through visions. Um, and um, just out in the world, how that is such a strange thing. And people definitely don't um, accept that very well or very easily, even though they will say that they believe the Bible and they agree with the Bible and um, that, you know, they believe God is real. And, but the second, the second someone mentions a vision, you know, people think of all of these false doctrines out there um like the jehovah's witnesses and the mormons and you know these people all had visions too um so you know they i think people um it it can it can leave a sour taste um but that's beside the point because that's how Yahweh has always spoken to his creatures is through visions. Um, and you can get all the way back, you know, um, Moses is the first writer in the Bible and Moses was given a vision. That was how Yahweh spoke to him at a burning bush. Um, can we pull that up where uh, with the burning bush, please? Exodus 3. Exodus 3 and 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the desert and came to the mountain of Yahweh, even to Horeb. And the angel of Yahweh appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Now, this is a vision that Moses is having um, that Yahweh has chosen this form to speak with Moses because he has something to tell him at this point um, in the in the timeline. And Moses, um, he sees that burning bush and the angel of Yahweh appeared to him. Um, and that. And that's how Yahweh spoke to him. And then if you go on, um, Yahweh gives Moses his name. And this was a very important event um, at this time. Um, and Moses, he's actually, um, after Yahweh brings the children of Israel out of Egypt, Moses, Yahweh gives him more information through more visions. So Yahweh takes him up into Mount Sinai and he spends 40 days, two times. Moses goes up and has 40 visions for 40 days. And Moses is shown the creation. We have it here written, written out so nicely on this chart. Um, you can see that. Um, in the top, you have on the left hand side, you have Moses laying um, in that cloud um, and you have panoramic vision of Elohim by Moses. And it shows an image of Yahweh, Elohim and Yahshua. And then that image um, transformed himself into a tabernacle to show Moses how to build this tabernacle in the wilderness. Um, Because that tabernacle is the pattern, well, Elohim is the pattern for all things. And this tabernacle is a physical representation of that. And then on Moses' second trip up into the mount, he saw, well, the first, the first trip too, the first seven days was the days of creation. And then on that second trip, he got the history um, from the fall of Adam. Um, so that was all shown to Moses, which is what um, gay, which is how Yahweh told him to write Genesis. And you have the recordings of history from the beginning of the creation um, through 
up until um, they're put into Egypt. And so that was all a vision that was given to Moses. Um, everything in the Bible is based on a vision. You can, um, right here at the beginning of our scripture, um, uh, if we can read that, um, just eight and one, Ezekiel 8 and 1. Ezekiel 8 and 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day in the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of Yahweh Elohim fell there upon me. So you have right here, um, as Ezekiel is sitting in his house, that the hand of Yahweh fell upon him. And then what happened? Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins, even downward, fire, and from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. Now, Ezekiel is seeing a vision. Um, he beheld it was the likeness as the appearance of fire. It, this, this is a vision that Ezekiel is being given by Yahweh. Um, and I want to go through just a couple of these. Um, I know it's like at the beginning of a bunch of these. I'm not, um, so I guess tried Jeremiah one and one. Jeremiah one and one, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hil Hilkiah of the priests that were in Anath in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of Yahweh came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah in the 13th year of his reign. Now you have right there, to whom the word of Yahweh came. Now this word of Yahweh is that, is Elohim, that is Yahweh in shape and form. That's that, um, that shape and form that you can see on this um, chart that Moses is looking at that has Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua written on it. Um, this is the image of Yahweh as the word. And that probably takes a little more breaking down, but I'm going to keep going. So the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah. Uh, let's get another one. Um, um, let's see. Uh, first Samuel oh. three and one. <laughs> and, the, and the child Samuel ministered unto Yahweh before Eli. And the word of Yahweh was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. Yeah. Um, the, so the word of Yahweh was precious and there was no open vision. Um, and if you can keep reading. Um, yeah, just keep reading this. I'll just stick here for a minute. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was lying down in his place. And his eyes began to grow dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of Yahweh went out in the temple of Yahweh, where the ark of Yahweh was, and Samuel was lying down to sleep. And Yahweh called Samuel, and he said, Here am I. And he <laughs> ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. Okay, so now what's happening here is Samuel was given um, to be raised in the temple by his mother because that's what she had promised Yahweh. And Eli was the priest at the time. And um, Samuel was still just a small child. And so they were all laying down to sleep. And Yahweh, Yahweh called to him. Um, and they... So that was in four, that Yahweh called to Samuel. And Samuel didn't understand, and he went to the high priest. Did you call me? <laughs> so you can keep going. And Yahweh called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not know Yahweh, neither was did not yet know Yahweh, Neither was the word of Yahweh yet revealed unto him. 
And Yahweh called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that Yahweh had called the child. So this happened three times. And Eli, he now understood that Yahweh is trying to talk to Samuel. Um, so what does he say? Therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be. If he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Yahweh, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And Yahweh came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Yep, so Yahweh came and stood and called as at other times Samuel. And Samuel, he finally, because Eli had instructed him, he finally understood that it was Yahweh that was calling to him and Yahweh who was going to speak to him. Um, and this is how, and the same thing happened with Moses. Yahweh called Moses out of the bush. He said, Moses, Moses. And he said the same thing. Here am I. And, um, you know, yeah, Yahweh's going to call you by name. He knows your name. Uh, and that's, that's beautiful. Um, so, so that was Samuel. Um, back in Genesis, um, you have Noah. Noah was given a vision about the flood. Um, and you can just follow these visions all the way down through. And it's not only that Yahweh gives visions because there's been a lot of people that claim that they've had visions, as I started out saying. But Yahweh, when he gives someone a vision, he always gives witnesses and he always gives proof that it's him that is giving the vision and he's going to give you the witnesses to back it up. So when Noah was given his vision that it was going to rain and the earth was going to be flooded, Yahweh he told him that him, his wife, and his three sons were going to get into the ark. Um, well, if you do a little bit of investigation, you'll find out that when Noah had this vision, he didn't have any sons. Um, so his three sons were his witnesses that what Yahweh spoke was true. Um, you have Moses. And when Yahweh gave Moses his name at the burning bush, he gave Moses witnesses. He had him throw his rod down and it became a snake and he picked it up and it became a rod again. And he had Moses stick his hand into his bosom and it came out leprous and he stuck it back and he healed him. And these were witnesses that were given to Moses so that he knew that what he was being told was true. And it was from Yahweh. And... um. And then you have, oh, can we get, um, Yahweh will speak to his people in visions. Sorry. Numbers 12 and 6. Thank you. Thank you. Um, numbers 12 and 6. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. Yep. Um, and I think that I really, where was that? Numbers? Is that what you're looking for? So that's, where was that? Numbers 12 and 6. Thank you. Um, yeah, I like, and uh, keep going. I like the next one too. Okay. Verse seven, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house so, with him. Yep. So Yahweh, um, he's telling them that if there be a prophet among you, I, Yahweh, will make myself known to him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. But Moses is not so. Moses is different. Keep going. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. In the similitude of Yahweh shall he not behold. 
shall he behold. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Um, so Yahweh is telling them because I believe this is where um they were um angry with Moses for something. They were always squabbling. Um and Yahweh is telling them that. I will choose who I speak to and I'll make myself known in visions and speak in dreams. But Moses was different. Moses was not so. And that's a whole nother lecture. Um, how that Joshua was Yahshua back there. Um, and that's just another thing that I just, I just love hearing someone go through, um, how Joshua is Yahshua. And, um, that's probably one of my favorite things. Um, but I say that about a lot of things. <laughs> so, um, these visions and dreams are important. Let's see what else I have tagged here. Um, uh, Proverbs 29 and 18. Proverbs 29, 18. Thank you. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps the law, happy is he. So now you need to have a vision. If there is no vision, the people perish. Noah had his vision. And if he had not, him and his family would have perished like everyone else. But because Yahweh had mercy on him, um, he, he was saved alive. And then you have, then, you know, we'll go, go right back on down to Moses. Um, he had that vision and that is that vision that Yahweh gave him. That is what fueled Moses to go down into Egypt. So Yahweh could bring them out of there. Um, he, Yahweh has always sent someone to, um, Yahweh has always sent someone to preach to the people for the purpose of salvation. Even when Yahshua came in, John the Baptist was sent before him. Where does it say that? I'm sorry, I'm terrible with scriptures. Um, how does it go? Sent. Uh, is that in John? One, um, uh, let's see, John three and twenty eight, John three and twenty seven, maybe twenty seven and twenty eight. John three twenty seven, John answered and said. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Messiah, but that I am sent before him. So he that hath have, the, yep, he so that have have, the bride, sorry. That's okay, thank you. Um, so you have John who is saying, I am sent before him. Who's him? That's Yahshua. Because John was sent to bear witness of him. Um, and to point him out as the Savior, John being the last Old Testament prophet. Um, and then, um, it, as it said in 27, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Well, what are you going to be given from heaven? You're going to be given a vision. And, um, you know, I've heard it said countless times these charts this is the vision that dr kinley had drawn out so that we can get an understanding of yahweh and that's um that's the whole point is to have an understanding and a knowledge of our creator um so can we get habeka two and two
Hello. Hold on. <laughs> I'm trying to find it. There it is. Rebecca two and two. I apologize. I don't have yep. to. <laughs> and Yahweh answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Okay, so write the vision and make it plain upon tables. Um, And that's what this organization, well, that's what Dr. Kinley was able to do for the souls that Yahweh wanted to share this vision with. He was able to write out these visions in such a way um, that we can get an understanding. Um, and that's, I mean, this chart, I just love this chart. It's absolutely incredible. You know, everyone describes it as scrambled eggs, <laughs> but it's got everything on it you have the down here in the left hand corner the earth inundated in water um that's right in the beginning um there with the creation and then you have the flood um you have um this representation of egypt with the passover um you have yashua down here with his death burial and resurrection um, and that's that's just that's all in the bottom section for a purpose and for a reason. And then you have this middle section of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And you have over on the left side, you have Mount Sinai. You have um, that representation of those elders gathered down there at that plateau. Um, and then you have moving up into the most holy place section of this chart. You have that cloud with Yahweh on top of the mountain. Um, looking on the other side, you have John um, and his vision of Yahshua um, that was given to Peter, James, and John, um, where Yahshua transfigured before them in the same way that he did for Moses back on Mount Sinai. Um, and this this whole chart is just, you know, this, it it just it can't. If someone said draw a picture of the of the entire Bible and put it all in one image, um, this this is what I think of now, because um, it's just it it covers everything, and and it's just there's always someone's always pointing out more details and more details, and I love seeing those little details that are on here and each of them is so important and really helps to build up an understanding of our creator um, and just how organized he is and how structured he has laid everything out and um, those are the witnesses to me that you just um, you can't deny um, that this was this was not put together by a man. This wasn't put together by Dr. Kinley. This was Yahweh, um, who is trying, who is uh, making himself known to his creatures here at this point in time, in the same way that he did with Noah, in the same way that he did with Moses. And Yahweh does not change, and he's not going to change. Um, and even though you know we. We consider ourselves much more advanced than maybe Moses's time with all of our electricity and our fancy gadgets and our cars and, you know, our civilized manners and, um, you know, society stuff that visions just don't seem right anymore. But it doesn't matter because they're right for Yahweh. And he has given the witnesses to show that he is in control. He has everything organized. Nothing is going to escape his pattern, no matter how civilized or intelligent we become as a species. Um, it's not going to escape Yahweh. Um, and that's comforting to me. I, I find that very, very comforting. Um, and I think with that, 
I'm going to say thank you so much for the time and let someone else continue on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, Dr. Pagano. It was very, very well spoken. And uh, now it is a pleasure to call on our next speaker, will be the Dean of our Syracuse, New York class, Dr. Patrick Trevison. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I enjoyed the statements of the first speaker. She's very simple, very basic, very direct, very innocent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like simple and basic and direct, and it's easy for me to understand. And uh, I hope to be able to tie in some of the things that, uh, some of the directions in which we'll be going to some of these things. Um, I think I'd like to start uh, I'd like to go over to Jeremiah um, 32. And um, read, uh, read. 28 for me, and then jump down to 33, please. Jeremiah 32, 28. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. So the city he's talking about is Jerusalem. And the people didn't think that this could happen. But um, you have to read this whole chapter, which we're not going to have time to be able to do. So we're going to jump right down to 33 here now. And they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Now, so who, I turned them. The, now who turned the back, Ted? Israel. Israel turned their back to him. They turned their back to him. Now that's something. When your creator picks you to be his chosen people and promises you blessings and you turn your back on him, that's something. That takes some chutzpah. If you don't know what that is, Dr. Geller can explain to you what that is after class. Now, keep reading, please, then. And they have turned unto me the back and not the face, though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. They did not hearken to receive instruction. And we understand now that uh, they didn't have the heart to hearken and to receive instruction back under that covenant. And he knew that they didn't. And he knew that this was going to engender an entirely new covenant. This was all part of the purpose. This was all set this way right from the outset, right from the very beginning. And it's all playing out just the way it's supposed to. And we're speaking historically. Read, please. 34. 
but they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name to defile it. Now, and what they, house was called by his name? The tabernacle or temple? The temple was called by his name. You can read in Second Kings, the 8th chapter, that Solomon built that house for his to contain his name and that they defiled it. That they defiled the house which is called by my name. Read, please. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which now they, I commanded. they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch. Now, Moloch was a god where people would cause their children, they would toss them into fire as a way of worshiping this god, Moloch. And even people in Israel got caught up in these practices because they got caught up in the practices of the people around them. And this is all coming down from Babylon all the way down through, and Israel is being caught up in all the practices of the God's and the goddesses which are all around them. And this is one example. In the Valley of Hinnom, Hinnom means place of lamentation, which means sorrow. So they built the high places or the groves. They went up into the groves to worship. We all know what those groves were. Those were the places they went up to party. And then they would come down and they would go into the temple. They were double-minded in all their ways. Read, please. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not. Neither came into my mind that they should do this abomination who caused Judah to sin. And now, therefore, thus saith Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, concerning this city, of which you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries to which I have driven them in mine anger. And now, if you fury, go back into, into kings, you can read the prayer that that uh, King Solomon gives um, when he's dedicating the temple in the name of Yahweh. And he prays that if the people shall turn their back and if he shall send them into captivity, if they will turn their if they will turn to him and if they will repent to him with all their heart that he will forgive them and bring them back and he repeats this prayer over and over again and sure enough they are taken into captivity over and over again and they are returned from captivity over and over again, just as King Solomon had prayed to him. That prayer was answered. So now here he's saying, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them to mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again into this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. And they shall be my people, 
and I will be their Elohim, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and for their children after them, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will not, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. So he's talking about what's going to happen after the day of Pentecost when he brings those people and forms that nation of Israel, spiritually speaking, and not physically speaking. Um, we'll get a quick reference for that, which is um, uh, uh, Romans 2, 28 and 29. Is it Romans? Yep. Yes. Romans 2 and 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. So now he's making this statement. This is Paul, and he's making this statement. He's writing this epistle after Pentecost, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So now that spirit is in the hearts and minds and souls of men permanently now. It's a brand new covenant. It's a brand new age. Old things are passed away. Read, please. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. So it's not physical Jews anymore. It's not physical circumcision anymore. It's not physical worship anymore. Read, please. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Now the Hebrew or the Israelite is one who is an Israelite inwardly. After the heart. Now you're able to hearken to him. To listen to his words. And to be obedient. Because he's causing you to walk in his statutes. Read, please. And circumcision is that of the heart. And circumcision mm -hmm. is that of the heart. Not of the foreskin, but of the heart. Cutting away that old heart. That cold heart. That hard heart. That stony heart. And making it a brand new heart, a soft heart, a brand new soul, giving you a brand new soul. Finish there, please, Scott. In circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Yahweh. Praise is not of men, not of priests, not of those scribes and Pharisees and all their fine linens and gold and, and, and all that sort of thing. But the praise is of Yahweh. Now, we're going to jump from there and we're going to jump over to Ezekiel. And before we can do this, we, I'd like to get the Babylon chart up. If that's possible. Can we get the Babylon chart up? The Daniel chart up. Thank you. 
Now, what we have here is a representation of Daniel's vision, which is in the second chapter of Daniel. And we're not going to take the time to read this. You can read it on your own time. And I recommend that you do so that you can see that we're not taking anything out of context or we're, we're not taking any liberties whatsoever. But the head of this image represents Babylon. And the chest of this image, which is silver, the head is gold, the chest is silver, that's Persia. Persia conquered Babylon. And when it did, it incorporated all their ways of worship. And then the abdominal region of this image is Grecia or that was Alexander the Great. He conquered Persia and then incorporated their ways of worship into their way of worship. And then the legs, which are, it says, pagan and papal Rome. There's two legs because it began as pagan Rome, which conquered the ancient Mediterranean world, the whole, which there's much more of it than you see on this map right here. But it broke in pieces all those ways of worship and conquered all those empires and made them all uh, provinces in their empire and incorporated all their ways of worship into their ways of worship. There were temples in Rome to all the goddesses and gods of all the places that they had conquered. Then in 476, and the, upon the collapse of pagan Rome, papal Rome took over and incorporated all of pagan Rome right into their practices. And so it still exists today. Now I'm going to give you a quick example. There was a queen of heaven back in Babylon, which was very popular at this time of year. Because this time of year, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers would overflow their banks and the soil would become very rich. And many things would grow and the people would prosper and live and thrive. And so they would worship a queen of fertility, a queen of heaven. And she was known in Babylon as Ishtar. She was known in Persia as Anahita. She was known to the Greeks as Aphrodite. She was known to the Romans as Venus. She was known to the papal Romans as Mary and Jesus. And she's the queen of heaven this very night. And she will be the queen of heaven when you go to church Sunday morning for Easter Sunday Mass. Easter Sunday is just a pagan part of this, all these empires at this time of year of fertility that has been passed down all the way to the Easter bunnies and the, the chocolate and the, the fertility and all of it has come all the way from from Babylon, all the way from that head of gold. Now, that's a 6,000-year lesson in history that you've got in the last seven or eight minutes or whatever. And we've obviously omitted a lot of things. The point was to get you to see principles that Queen of Heaven has been prevalent in all these empires all the way down through. In Egypt, 
She was known as Isis. The Canaanites worshipped her as Astarte. And the Hebrews worshipped her as Ashtoreth. They worshipped her as Ashtoreth. Now, uh, we need to go over there quick. We need to go over to uh, Jeremiah. Uh, I think it's 43. Jeremiah 43. Jeremiah 44. And start reading in 15, please. Jeremiah 44, 15. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women who stood by a great multitude, even all the people who dwell in the land of Egypt and Pathros, Answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of Yahweh, we will not hearken unto thee. We will not listen to what you say about what Yahweh wants us to do. Now, as Tony talked about these visions, you see, this vision had appeared to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah had to go to these people and tell them what they were doing and that he was not happy with it. And they're giving him their response and they're saying, we're not going to listen. Just as it said over there in that other chapter in uh, Isaiah, where they turned their back on him. Read, please. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven. There's the Queen of Heaven, and they're burning incense to her, and they knew her as Ashtoreth. And they were burning incense to their Queen of Heaven. Because we told you Israel got caught up in what they were doing, those gods and those goddesses and those tribes and those peoples that surrounded them. Read, please. And to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the city of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and were well and saw no evil. But since we ceased to burn incense to the queen of heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have lacked all things and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her? And pour now there's, out your, there's the origin of your hot cross buns. Read, please. And pour out drink offerings unto her without our husbands. Then Jeremiah said all this to the people, to the men, to the women, and to all the people who had given him that answer, saying, The incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes, and the people of the land, did not Yahweh remember them, and it came not into his mind? So that that's Yahweh good, could... Deb, that's good. Okay. But they, they worshipped uh, that, that Queen of Heaven uh, as Ashtoreth, and they worshipped Dumuzi or Tammuz. You'll read references about how the, the women wept for Tammuz, which was the Hebrew for Dumuzi, who was worshipped in Babylon, which was another name for Nimrod. You can check all these things out and verify the validity of them. Don't believe it just because we're saying so. Now, we're going to have to go over to the scripture reading, uh, Ezekiel 8th chapter, please. We had a set up that what Israel is doing how they got caught up in these things. And on this map, there's that little white area there 
where one of the arms is folded. You see where it says Arabia and the serpent is there and it says 666. If you go over to the left, the arms are crossed and there's a little white triangle there. That is modern day, part of it is modern day Israel. Right there. That's where all this is going on. Read, please. Ezekiel 8 and 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of Yahweh Elohim fell there upon me. Now, now uh, Tony talked about these visions. Now, if the hand of Yahweh Elohim fell upon him, that means he's having the vision. Read, please. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins, even downward, fire. And from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. He's seeing Yahweh Elohim. He's seeing him in his, in his brightness. Read, please. And he put forth the form of a hand. And took me by a lock of mine head, and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of Elohim to Jerusalem. And to he the brought Jerusalem. him in a vision to the city of Jerusalem. So just so over everybody's uh, on the same page and where we're going with this. Read, please. To the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the Elohim of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north, so I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. There were a bunch of gates to the city of, of uh, Jerusalem, see, various gates. But go ahead and read. He said, furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here that I should go far off from my sanctuary. So he's talking about abominations that the children of Israel are committing. Read. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. He brought, me, he brought him to the door of the court. Okay, which is the outer part of the temple. Read. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, an abominable beast, and the elder, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. All the wall, upon the walls, see, just as we had picked up over there in, in Jeremiah, that they put these, they set up idols to their gods in Solomon's temple. And we can we can give you book on that. Various kings set up altars to other gods right in the temple of right, right in Yahweh's temple. Read, please. Uh, so I went in and saw, behold, every form of creeping things and abo an abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel betrayed on the wall round about. 
And there's all the the idols of the house of Israel portrayed around about. Read. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. Now there's 70 men of the house of ancients of the house of Israel. Read. And in the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shephan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery? Every man in the chambers of his imagery, or in the chambers of his imagination. In the chambers of his imagination. This has always been about men's imaginations. All those gods and goddesses, all down through histories, were nothing more than the product of men's and women's imaginations. They're they're all just delusions. Read, please. For they say, Yahweh seeth us not. Yahweh Yahweh doesn't see us. Imagine that. Yahweh doesn't see us. Now, there's people right in our school this very night who think Yahweh doesn't see us. Read, please. For they say, Yahweh seeth us not. Yahweh hath forsaken the earth. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of Yahweh's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat woman weeping for Tammuz. There's the women weeping for Tammuz. Women weeping for Tammuz, a Babylonian deity. Read, please. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of Yahweh's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of Yahweh, between the porch and the altar. Now look, he's in the inner court, between the porch and the altar. In the inner court, read. Were about five and twenty men with There's their backs. Twenty-five men with their backs toward the temple of Yahweh. With their backs toward the most holy place. Their backs are toward the most holy place. Read, and their faces toward the east. And their faces are toward the east, which is where the gate was, the entry to the temple, faced east. Their faces were toward the east, read. And they worshiped the sun toward the east. And they worshiped the sun. You wonder why they're going to have. Uh, Easter sunrise services on Easter Sunday morning. You wonder where it came from? Here's where it came from. Ancient Babylon worshiping the physical sun. Read. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Hast thou seen this? These guys got their face to the east and they've turned their back on their creator. They've turned their back on Yahweh Elohim. They've turned their back on Yahweh. 
That's just what they've done. He's he's talking about great abominations. Read. Um, then said, uh, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is, is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. That's yet the he will not hear them. Do you understand? These are the things Israel did down through history to provoke their creator. These are the things that time and time again he would forgive them until it got to a point where it was time to usher in a new covenant. A covenant where they would never again do these kinds of things. I'm just going to take, I'm going to get one more reference here. If I might, I want to go to second Corinthians, the 10th chapter. And, uh, uh, just read three through five. Second Corinthians 10 and three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So now who is this speaking, Deb? This is Paul. This is Paul. And do you have a do you have a no, time on your uh yeah, I should in the beginning. Uh AD fifty-seven. About AD fifty-seven, AD sixty or so. It's a Roughly yeah. 30, 30 years or so after the outpouring yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay. So he's writing 30 years after the Holy Spirit has been poured out. And in other words, there's a brand new covenant in effect now. They're in a brand new age. A brand new age. There's a this is the kingdom, present kingdom age that they're in now. Present kingdom age. Uh, go ahead and read. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. No, the well, weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are the truth, the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. And they are not physical weapons, but they are powerful weapons. Powerful, powerful weapons. Read. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through Yahweh Elohim to the pulling down of strongholds. To the pulling down of strongholds, of forts, of redoubts. Do you understand of Strongholds. I had things in my mind when I came into class. I had things up in there. I had walls built up around them that were just protected. They were never going to be touched. They were sacrosanct to me. No one could see them. No one could touch them. Do you understand? Until that name of Yahweh just brought those walls right down. Just brought them right down. That was it. Read, please. Casting down imaginations and every Casting high thing. Casting down imaginations. There's that imagination. The imaginations that were brought up in Ezekiel, there's still imaginations that we're dealing with 
every night when we go to Zoom. There's imaginations that we're dealing with every night that we go to live class. We are in a war against imagination. We are in a war against lies. And our weapons are not carnal. They are the truth and they are the scriptures, the law and the prophets. And they are the gospel, the preaching of the gospel in its simplicity. Read, please, Deb. Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Yahweh. Against the knowledge of Yahweh. Every high thing that vaults itself, that vaults itself above the thrones of Yahweh, above the stars of Yahweh. And you can read all about that over there in Jeremiah, the 14th chapter, the 12th 12th verse. uh, I'm not going to take the time to get it. That Satan always just wants to, you understand, extend his throne above the throne of Yahweh. He wants to get above the throne. It's imaginations above the high, the high places of Yahweh. But the gospel and the truth will bring all these things down. All these things down. And we just have to humbly submit and, and, and just bow to the truth that we have heard because we wouldn't know one single one of these things had we not come into this class and into this teaching and had these things revealed to us through the auspices of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the time. I hope someone was edified And I'm going to turn this back over to the moderator. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, Dr. Trevison. And at this time, it's a pleasure to call on our third speaker, which will be Dr. Diane Emler from our Oceanside, California class. Dr. Emler. I gotta get you be able to sit someplace. Hold on. Okay. She's here. Hold on. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> oh. Hello. Hello. I had to climb over dogs to get here, so. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed class tonight. Uh, I am just not sure um, where to go uh, at this point. Uh, since, uh, Since Ricky called it, Let's go over to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 and 12. Thank you. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? Who just weaken the nations. Okay, so it really is surprising uh, that in Christianity, uh, I'll say the main uh, denominations in Christianity, uh, being the Baptists, the Methodists, uh, the Presbyterians, uh, you don't hear about Satan 
or Lucifer. It is a subject that is not uh, uh, discussed because in these quote-unquote modern times, uh, people will accept that there is a God, that there is uh, someone who is responsible for bringing this creation into existence. But most people don't believe in Satan. Uh, They have heard uh, about Satan mostly in uh, movies and TV shows. Uh, The image of someone with uh, in a red suit and horns uh, is the image that uh, they are used to, uh, but it's something obviously that they reject. It doesn't fit their lifetime or their lifestyles. So we in this class have recognized that if you have a creator, There has to be an opposing side to that creator. There has to be a mystery of iniquity. There has to be, uh, let me put it this way, if you want to learn about Yahweh, if you want to learn about your creator, which Uh, In John 17, we know that learning of him is, uh, why don't we just go over there and read it, 17 and 3. John 17 and 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true El, and Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. So, life eternal is to know Yahweh and his son. And if you're going to learn any subject, you have to understand that you need an opposing side uh, to be able to understand the righteous. Uh, You don't watch a a movie or TV show where you have a quote-unquote good guy. Well, you know he's the good guy because you've been introduced to the bad guy. And the bad guy often uh, reveals the good guy. Uh, You thought he was just... uh, a husband or something until uh, something gets blown up and then he's got to go out and catch the bad guy. Um, And it's the same thing with Yahweh. Unless you have an imposing view, you can't learn about Yahweh to the extent that we can know him. Uh, It's like reading the pages in a book. Uh, They make the print in the tables in the book in black. And if they made the uh, print white, then you'd never be able to read it. It has to be in black. It has to be opposing to be able to read it. And it works that same way in photography or in anything else. And you have to have 
uh, an opposite background so it can be read or it can be seen. So there has to be a Satan, and he's not portrayed, the way he's portrayed is not the way that he is. Uh, in uh, Genesis, once you go back there uh, in the second chapter, I'm not sure the verse, I want uh, where he's subtle. Uh, Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahweh Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath Elohim said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Go ahead. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For Yahweh Elohim doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil. Now, we have learned a few things from those couple verses. And what we've learned is the mystery of iniquity is subtle, meaning he's not overt. He's not going to be uh, the homeless person dressed in rags, uh, talking to himself on the street. He's not going to be uh, 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 wearing a red suit and having horns. He is subtle. Now, Yahweh told Adam, that in the day you eat of that fruit of the tree of good and evil, you shall surely die. And when the mystery of iniquity came up to Eve and said, won't you sure, you know, he asked what Yahweh said, and what he said, she said, is he told us we would die if we touch the fruit. And he turned around and said, oh, you shall not surely die, but it'll make you as a god. And he just turned that statement up uh, on its heels and made it completely opposite because it was you shall not Die. That one little word, not, changed the whole meaning of what Yahweh said. And it wasn't a serpent that came up to Eve. Who is going to be afraid of a serpent? Who can that? It's too overt. It's too obvious because the mystery of iniquity is subtle. And he came to Eve like a beautiful angel. And that's why she was uh, uh, fooled by that. Okay. So let's go back over to uh, um, Isaiah 14 and pick that up again. 1412. Isaiah 14, 12, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, who didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Yahweh. I will sit up also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now, he's, okay, I'm going to cut you there. Uh, he says that he's going to sit upon the mount of the congregation. And Rick was 
talking about uh, that temple uh, that sat on the mount. And he, his, the Mister of Iniquity has a job. And the job is to turn Israel away from Israel, uh, away from Yahweh. Uh, but before that, in the verse, we have uh, uh, Lucifer, or the mystery of in uh, iniquity, uh, said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of Elohim. And we can read on further, but he is saying that he's not only going to be ahead, he's going to be above Yahweh. Uh, and he was set as the uh, angel overshadowing. So in he looked like he was above Yahweh, and he fooled uh, the entire uh, uh, nation of Israel. And that's because they kept turning away from Yahweh. Now, when, uh, uh, can we have the uh, Moses chart? I want you to see here in the Moses chart that there was an adversary down in Egypt, and that was Pharaoh. Uh, Moses went down and said to Pharaoh, let my people go. And he scoffed at that. He's not going to let his uh, uh, slaves go. Uh, and they went back and forth to the uh, Tenth plague, which was the plague of death. And uh, Israel had the four points of blood on the doors so that death angel passed over them. Uh, the Egyptians did not have the blood on the door. So they were affected by this death. And the death was the firstborn of every nation. It was the firstborn, not only of people, but it was firstborn of cattle uh, and sheep. It was the firstborn of everything that died. And Israel, this nation of Israel, saw that death. And yet, well, let me go this far. So when Israel came to the waters of the Red Sea, uh, Pharaoh had changed his mind and decided he didn't want Israel to go. And so when Israel started to go through uh, the Red Sea on dry ground, Yahweh went behind them and caused Israel to be in light, but caused the Egyptians to be in darkness. And then once Israel was through on dry ground, then Pharaoh in his host saw that parting of the Red Sea and ran in with his chariots and all of his fighters. And then the Red Sea closed on them and they all died. But in the Bible, you read that their bodies were washed up on the side of the wilderness of Sinai. And you can kill a body, but you can't kill a spirit. And that's what the mystery of iniquity is. 
It's the spirit of evil. As much as Yahweh, or let's take Yahshua, uh, he was born uh, of a virgin. He was in a body that was not like a body that you and I have. It was a, a, a body uh, without uh, uh, sin. Uh, it was in the likeness of sinful flesh, but did not have that sinful flesh. And when he died and buried, he resurrected on the third day. And that's what they're going to celebrate uh, on Easter, is the resurrection uh, of what they call Jesus. Accurately, it's Yahshua. So they're celebrating that resurrection. And yet they can't see that, first of all, he did not resurrect a, a, a physical body, but he resurrected, I need, um, if somebody can find it, that quickening spirit. Is, is that in John? Check Diane. first. What one? Check First Corinthians fifteenth chapter, like around forty, Bruce says. Okay. So that was yeah, fifteen forty-five. Fifteen forty-five. Uh, so first it, Corinthians fifteen forty-five. And so it is written: the first man Adam was made a living soul; the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Right. So. Adam was a man. Yahshua was only in the likeness of sinful flesh. And when he, rec uh, when he resurrected, he resurrected a quickening spirit. And he walked uh, uh, in that time, uh, continuing with the disciples for 40 days resurrection and the first time he appeared uh let's say to i think it was mary and miriam uh came to the uh tomb and they saw him and they supposed him to be the gardener well, they spent the last three and a half years with him. Why would they look at him and say, oh, he must be the gardener here. We'll ask him. And then he encountered uh, other apostles walking towards the tomb. And he's walking with them and they're all sad and Yahshua says, what's up? And so uh, they said, where have you been? Haven't you heard that Yahshua, the prophet, was crucified, so on and so forth? They did not recognize him. Well, if he resurrected a physical body, then they would have recognized him, but he resurrected a Quickening spirit, see? And he resurrected a quickening spirit. And that mystery of iniquity was as a spirit as well. And the reason why the world is looking for Yahshua, Jesus, to come back is they never could see and still can't see that he never left. Because uh, 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 after his resurrection, after his 
40 days uh, uh, in that resurrection, uh, 10 days later, uh, he poured out his spirit, which is him. He is spirit. And he poured out his spirit uh, on some 120 folks that were in the upper room. And then Pete, they all come down and Peter speaks. And when Peter speaks, there's like another three or 5,000 that come uh, into the fold just on that day. Yahshua came uh, uh, on that day of Pentecost, June 6th, and he never uh, left. And so they're all waiting for him to come back. And as I'd like to put it, he's not coming back. He's about to leave because he is life. And when he leaves, all life will go within him. It's the only way uh, he will present us to the Father is in him. So that spirit, uh, that mystery of iniquity, Pharaoh, who was the oppressor of the children of Israel, who denied the power of Yahweh, drowned in the Red Sea, but the bodies washed up on the other side. And but that spirit, you can't kill a spirit with water. So that spirit right there and ended up entering into the children of Israel, so much so that after they received the law direct from Yahweh, and one of those laws was that have no uh, more graven images. And if you look to the Ten Commandments that the Roman Catholic Church has put out, they have removed that commandment and made another commandment uh, two. So they still have ten. But this image uh, that Israel made was a golden calf. And when Moses came down off of that mountain, he was so upset at what he saw, he threw the Ten Commandments down and broke them into pieces. And that is Yahweh's broken heart. And Israel, many of the Israelites died that day. Uh, and then 40 days uh, after that, after the Ark of the Covenant was made, then Moses went back up. But Yahweh said, this time I'm not going to uh, uh, provide uh, the tablets of stone. He told Moses to cut out the stone and that he would write upon him. So Moses, uh, is it Jeremiah 31, 31? Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I make with their father, and the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. Yes, and they not only broke it then, but uh, Rick just how 
much Israel uh, uh, defamed the name of Yahweh and how much Yahweh did for them. He was a husband unto them. He provided for them. He watched out for them. He caused them to uh, kill their enemies. He just always is turning around and doing, 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 doing for Israel. And what does Israel do? They turn his their backs on Yahweh. They cause the name to become an abomination. They offer up uh, sacrifices uh, that were not worthy. Let's go over to Malachi. I have to grab my book here. <laughs> I know it's kind of all over the place there. Um, Offering blind sacrifices? Yes. Um, yeah. One in six. <laughs> Malachi one is start, started at five, five. and um, okay, Malachi one and five. Yeah, and, and your eyes shall see, and you shall say, Yahweh will be magnified from the border of Israel. Right, go ahead. <laughs> A son honoreth his father. And a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? So Yahweh is going. If I'm a master, where's my honor? Like you give honor to your masters and to your own fathers. Well, what about me? That's to understand your father, your physical father has a name. You may have called him dad for the first year, but at some point you had to learn his name. Go on. And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith yeah. Yahweh host unto you. And the oh. fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. And you have to believe that he is. To be able to fear him. Now, there is fear that is respect, but there is fear that is real fear because it's a horrible thing to fall in the hands of the living Elohim or in Yahweh. That fear, when you recognize how powerful he is, when you recognize his ever presence and you forget about it, when you remember again, it's a fearful thing because there's no place that you can go and hide. He is a loving El, and I don't want anybody to be afraid all the time, but a healthy fear can be healthy. When you try to decide what you're going to physically do in your life, I hope that makes sense. Go ahead. Where is my fear, saith Yahweh of hosts, unto you, O priests, that despise my name? And ye say, wherein have ye de we despised thy name? Now, he's saying, Yahweh is saying to not just regular Israel, but to the priests. These priests are supposed to teach the people the law, and yet they have despised his name. And they're like, well, how have we despised your name? 
Go ahead and read. Verse 7, ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and ye say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, the table of Yahweh is contemptible. Now, the law in the prophets, I got five minutes, the law in the prophets are Yahshua's biography. They are written so that when Yahshua comes, we can know who he is. And uh, I can't remember, oh God, the name when he says, um, we have found him of whom the law and the prophets speak. And this is all, what was it? John 145. Okay, John 145. Let's get it quick. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Yahshua of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, thank you very much. The law and the prophets were about Yahshua. And they're offering polluted bread up for a sacrifice. And didn't Yahshua say, I am the bread? You had, uh, you had manna back in the wilderness of Sinai, but I am that true bread. Now, when the priests polluted the bread, they are polluting that which shows forth Yahshua. It is the good bread, the manna that shows forth Yahshua, but they have polluted it. And in so doing, they've polluted the type and shadow. They polluted the example of him. That's all I can say. Go to eight. Malachi 1 8. Malachi 1 8. I didn't make it clear. <laughs> And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Mm -hmm. Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith Yahweh of hosts? Now, the same thing. He, Yahshua, is the lamb. And you're offering up a blind sacrifice. Was Yahshua blind? Certainly not. And yet they have defiled the type and example of Yahshua. And all of this is how they're polluting his name. And they just do not get it. Okay, read on. And now I pray you, beseech Elohim that he will be gracious unto us. This hath been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Yahweh of hosts? Mm -hmm. uh, go that? down to 11. Okay, verse 11. Far, for from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith Yahweh of hosts. Now he's turning around and he's saying the heathen, the Gentiles, that didn't even receive this covenant, they are the ones who are going to praise my name. Twelve. But ye have profaned it, and that ye say, the tables of Yahweh is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his meat, is contemptible. Okay. I'm out of time, but I hope you see 
something in all of that. Um, I think there just was an immense amount of uh, information given out today. Uh, I always kind of forget about Easter, but this year, since it's on my birthday, I couldn't forget about it. <laughs> so, uh, But Yahweh is real, and he is ever-present with us. And I pray we do not forget that. So with that, I'll hand it back over to the moderator. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, Dr. Emler. And that will conclude our class. Thank you all for attending. We will conclude with the doxology taken from the last two verses of the Book of Jude, the Holy Name Bible. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless in the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let the class say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.